Hello, everybody. I'm Dan Van Hoyle, and I'm here to tell you about things you don't want to know about. That's what I like. Okay. All right. I love it. <laughs> Shove it down their brains. Okay. Anyway, let us begin. So, as the poem goes, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Now, it goes on and on, and then it also continues. The Arakawa Indians were very nice. They gave the sailors food and spice. And that looked kind of like this. This is a, uh, this is a painting from, uh, from uh, Gallo Galena in 1900 of uh, Christopher Columbus accepting a native woman as a gift, which is what brings us to our topic matter. Yeah, so, because what actually happened is that... Um, uh, with the arrival of Columbus's ships, yeah. uh, they unwittingly brought more than two dozen diseases to which Europeans were immune, but were deadly to the people of the New World. And in fact, this period of sickness and genocide, ultimately within just a few years' time, resulted in the death of 100 million people, or 95% of the indigenous population. In fact, it was the largest mass extinction since the comet that hit the Earth 65 million years ago that wiped out the dinosaurs. And here it was happening again in just the same short amount of time. Now, but they did, and this is kind of the stuff that they brought with them. They brought all these fantastic diseases to which uh, we're all immune, which are animal-based. Uh, but, you know, they didn't go back empty-handed because, or empty penis. Uh, because along with, uh, along with all of the, all of the, uh, the treasures from paradise, uh, you have the, the sugar and the tobacco and uh, uh, the café. Um, <laughs> there was a stowaway in the blood and semen of the semen, uh, <laughs> including Columbus's himself. And of course, payback's a bitch. Uh, we got all these diseases. Uh, is that all you got? Okay, all right. So, well, we, uh, syphilis came back. And uh, unfortunately, syphilis was, or fortunately, syphilis was the only major disease that crossed the pond in the other way and affected Europe from the Americas. Uh, we kind of deserved it. But the evidence shows that syphilis did not exist in Europe until Columbus's trip. And that in 1493, when, uh, and, for, and most people believe that, in 1493, uh, the, when Columbus returned, uh, the helmsman and several members of the crew, including Columbus, uh, crew members of the Nina, reported to the fleet doctor complaining of uh, these horrible headaches and very high fevers and these sores all over their bodies that they had contracted from women in the West Indies. Um, so there you have it. Well, most evidence shows that... Um, like I say, this had only this had come from the uh, from Hispaniola, uh, but the thing was is that the the native populations were kind of immune to that themselves, just like the Europeans were immune to all the diseases that ultimately killed the new people in the New World. Now, what happened is that um, it didn't st even though they were complaining all these diseases, it didn't stop them from passing it on to uh, to waterfront prostitutes in Barcelona. Horse, yeah. Which, of course, they would then transfer to the mercenaries, Spanish mercenaries, which were then hired by, which then turned out to be hired by uh, King Charles VIII of France in order to invade Naples. And then so he invaded Naples, and uh, it caused a horrible, the very first epidemic of syphilis, which happened in, um, back in 1495, that actually included uh, King Charles VIII himself where 20,000 people, mostly soldiers, were afflicted with syphilis uh, at this one time. And that was the first epidemic that broke out in Italy. Um, and uh, uh, King Charles got it, and so his biographer called this the Great Pox, and that's where that came from. Well, within five years, it was all over the continent, uh, and it actually affected more than 15% of the European population. In fact, that's why it was referred to as the Third Plague, or the Revenge of the Americas. So where does this come from? This is a spirochete, a Treponemium pallidum. Uh, this is, a, this is a, another example of it right here. So there you go. And uh, 
don't say, don't say I never gave you nothing. And, uh, yeah. So, uh, so if, it, if it looks familiar, great, cool. Uh, if it looks familiar, um, it's, it's because it actually shares the same ancestor as sperm. Coincidence? Who knows? Well, anyway, so I'm going to spare you all the ugly pictures. I made this little movie. Let's see if I can get it to wor working on here. Uh, but I, I, I'm going to show you on the doll where the bad disease touched you. So anyway, so first happens is that there's, a, there's an initial sore called a shanker. And, uh, and so then it's followed by these uh, burning headaches and burning all over the body. And then you get these uh, also like lesions all over the body that are happening. You get bleeding from the eyes. Uh, and then it all goes away. So there are three phases. The shanker goes away. All these symptoms go away. And then... Uh, 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 once that goes away, it goes into this period of latency, and so you can, you can have, be symptom-free for decades, absolutely. And then the tertiary phase comes in, in which uh, suffers where the, the spirochetes kind of get into every organ, including the brain, and uh, you eventually get demented and paralyzed, go blind and deaf, and then you die. Um, so there you go. Yeah. So what's interesting about this is that there, as a little, as a bit of a side, uh, as a little uh, coincidence because of this, or a little like cruel consolation prize, in the tertiary phase of syphilis, a lot of people get this this amazing boost in creative and mental energy, and uh, it causes intense mental clarity and creativity. And some of the the world's best known syphilitics, uh, including Mozart, Vincent Van Gogh, uh, Oscar Wilde, and Nietzsche, uh, were said to have had. Um, were, were known to have had syphilis and that they were actually credited, um, uh, they actually credited syphilis with this genius. In fact, uh, Sigmund Freud said of Nietzsche, he said that the most essential factor, um, he said that the most essential factor um, <laughs> in, Nietzsche's, uh, in Nietzsche's introspection was his syphilis. And in fact, he was quoted as saying, he placed his disposition at the service of science. Science, yes. Now, for centuries, the most, uh, the most common cures, the, the most common treatments for this, because there was no cure. Uh, it was totally lethal eventually. You just don't know where you get it. But the most common treatments uh, involved dabbing mercury all over your face and all over your body onto these shankers. And if, sorry? It makes you glow, absolutely. And um, yeah, and the thing is that they would dis you put mercury on it and then they would disappear because, of course, all the shankers disappear on their own, and so they thought that it worked. And so that became all the rage. So it became very popular and fashionable for women to dab this little tincture of mercury in, in charcoal and put it on their shankers to hide them, and that gave birth to the uh, to the beauty mark uh, craze. In fact, they even had these little patches that they would cut out of velvet or mouse skin and then put over the tinctures or, or over the or, and, and over the shankers as well to hide them. And so they would walk around, and that created this whole new uh, craze of the beauty mark that we see today. Um, and yes, absolutely. And um, so uh, the other cool thing about that is that um, you. Uh, if you couldn't, of, of course, you couldn't hold mooshes in place on the neck, where the larger shankers and the rashes would happen. This is uh, this is Johnny Depp in uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, and uh, he uh, he decided that uh, that Captain uh, that uh, that that Captain Jack that Captain Jack Sparrow should have syphilis, as he would uh, a character of those days. And so, if you go see the movies, he'll always have this little syphilis uh, rash on his jaw for all the children to enjoy. Um, <laughs> So there you have that. Now, so what that happened is that that, of course, started this whole craze of, um, of, of the roughs under the neck. And then with that, um, all these fashionable things. And then, of course, you'd also get into the powdered wigs, and then, of course, all, uh, which also hit all of the, the foul-smelling sores on the hair because the hair would fall out. And, of course, you look at these gentlemen closely, and you can see that they, too, have shankers on the face um, and uh, very historically correct. Thing. So the other thing is that you could also take a mercury steam bath. Um, I'm sure very healthy as well. I got rid of it. So um, so yeah. So anyway, fast forward to 1928. So uh, this uh, Dr. Alexander Fleming came back from vacation in Scotland, and he came back to a dirty workbench uh, in his lab, and he was trying to grow. Uh, he was trying to grow uh, some cultures of Staphylococcus, but this this damn mold kept eating it. 
And uh, so penicillin was born. Science. Uh, I, actually, it's, that's not the whole story because actually all Fleming did was write a paper on it and then forgot about it. So anyway, so meanwhile, back in the United States, in, um, in Alabama, in Macon County, Alabama, there was a, a huge um, epidemic of, uh, of syphilis where 35% of the population had syphilis. And so the Public Health Service started the Tuskegee Syphilis Experiment where uh, they would study the effects of untreated syphilis. And so they already had 600 African Americans and then 400 of those had syphilis and then half of those they gave treatments of 500, uh, 500 pounds of mercury slathered on their bodies per year per patient. Um, and then the other 300 in the study, or the other 200 in the study, they did nothing to, just watched what happened. And so they did uh, just track to see how that was going. So anyway, let's fast forward to 1940. Um, bacteriologists up in Oxford, Flory and Chain, uh, were flipping through 12-year-old back issues of a British pathology journal when they came across Alexander Fleming's article. Uh, and they said, you know, well, we too should see if we can grow this penicillium uh, stuff. And uh, so anyway, so they started growing this mold and they killed a bunch of mice and they saved a bunch of mice and they go, Eureka. And they were about to go on to these human trials, but they, stepped, they kept getting interrupted by this, uh, by this angry man in uh, stage two syphilis uh, by the name of uh, uh, Adolf Hitler, uh, who kept bombing them. And so they packed, every, they packed up everything and they moved to Peoria, Illinois, where they started growing this penicillium in everything they could find, including bedpans. <laughs> the trouble was it took 2,000 liters of penicillium culture to make one human dose. And so they knew they needed a much uh, better type of, of uh, species to get this culture. Well, one day, their laboratory assistant, Mary Hunt, uh, went, to, uh, went to the market and she comes back with a cantaloupe, and she remarked, wow, what a pretty golden mold. <laughs> it turns out that this pretty golden mold was Penicillium chrysogenum, which was actually 200 times more potent at producing penicillin than the, the stuff that uh, they were using with Alexander Fleming. And uh, so anyway, they rushed the melon off to Carnegie Mellon, <laughs> as one does. And, uh, and they bombarded with x-rays and they made a thousand times the penicillin out of that mold. And so sure enough, uh, they were able to have enough to, to produce quick medicine. The first person cured was Ann Miller, maybe it looks familiar, who was dying of sepsis from a, uh, from a miscarriage in, uh, in a hospital in, in New Haven, Connecticut. They injected her and she was cured in overnight. And in fact, her temperature chart is now viewable at the Smithsonian. So, Thank you very much. And so they rushed this into production and uh, they started producing it in these giant vats of beer. And, uh, and before, by the, within a few months, uh, they had 400 million units of penicillin, enough to go to D-Day with. And by the end of the war, and by the, actually, yeah, by the end of the war, they were producing 650 billion, with a B, units of penicillin every month. And by 1950, every single dose of penicillin came from spores from Mary Hunt's moldy little melon. So how about that? Yeah, pretty good. And so, yeah, so science, science indeed. Yeah, serendipity, even more. So anyway, so uh, where was I? Oh yeah, um, okay. Now, thanks to the adoption of penicillin as this cure, um, it was, uh, it was, it saved the war, it cured gonorrhea, it cured syphilis, uh, and it became the preferred treatment for curing syphilis. And, uh, and so, in fact, by 1958, um, the Centers for Disease Control declared that uh, there was complete eradication of syphilis in 90% of counties in the United States. But meanwhile, we forget about what was going on in Macon. The CDC, secretly continued the Tuskegee, the Tuskegee experiment without telling one until 1972 when it was exposed by a San Francisco journalist who overheard two doctors talking about a patient who wasn't allowed to get penicillin because he was part of some study. So anyway, so they ended it in 1972 and it was terrible because these men were never told that they had syphilis. So for 40 years, they were forced to endure and suffer the disease. In fact, they were even kept out of military service for fear that they might have been given penicillin at some time in the future. 
they did, the, the woman who took the, uh, the blood test from them said that they did know that they had a venereal disease. They didn't know what it was because one of them said to her, uh, what you've done in the dark, do come back in the light. And so she thought they, they must have known something was up, but nobody told them, and they suffered until 1972. Um, syphilis continues to rise, back to epidemic proportions today, but we have, we have penicillin to cure that. And so for that, I want to raise a glass and offer toast to the only person in the discovery of penicillin who did not receive a Nobel Prize, uh, Mary Hunt and her magnificent moldy cantaloupe. Thank you.